Within every country, so the prophets and martyrs tell us, there is another land, a land where nobody is master and nobody slave, where there are no rich and no poor, where justice reigns. It surfaces now and again, in promises, in flights of fancy, in struggles, in designs and fabrics. It is lost and found and lost again, but it is always there, for the human spirit is its home. Fifteen Antwerp, Flanders. The port is abuzz with tales of New World adventures. One summer night, whilst on a diplomatic mission for King Henry VIII, Thomas More goes strolling down by the wharves. There he meets, or imagines, Raphael Hithliday, a seafarer, who says that he has visited an island called Utopia, situated in some remote part of the Antipodes. The seafarer tells the Renaissance humanist and future martyr, my father's favourite saint, that Utopia is shaped somewhat like a croissant, that its capital city is equidistant from all the other major cities of the island, and that its people live in terrace houses, with gardens and fruit trees in the shared backyard. Most strikingly, he says that in Utopia there is neither money nor private property all delivered to public warehouses the fruit of their labours, and freely take whatever they need. The economy is planned. There is no hoarding, and hunger is unknown. Work and recreation are shared. They eat in communal refectories. The community takes charge of children while their parents are busy. Most space is occupied by gardens and orchards, and music is to be heard everywhere. Equality for all, the seafarer explains, results in enough for each. Nineteen hundred and four, Brisbane, Queensland, Commonwealth of Australia, the Antipodes, the place where I was born. Constance Campbell Petrie writes of the Tourbal, the indigenous people of the land. If there were unfortunates who had been unlucky in the hunt for food, it made no difference. They did not go without, but shared equally with the others. Nine hundred and twenty two Planet Anares, Tau Seti, the Cosmos. The dirigible comes down at a cargo depot at the south end of town, and Shevik, a young cosmologist, sets off into the streets of the biggest city in the world. It is a bare city, bright, the colours light and hard, the air pure. The squares, the austere streets, the low buildings, the unwalled workyards, are charged with vitality and activity. As Shevik walks, he is constantly aware of other people walking, working, talking, faces passing, voices calling, gossiping, singing. People alive, people doing things, people afoot. No doors are locked. Few doors are even shut. There are no disguises and no advertisements. 1861, London, England. A group of craftsmen and women, profoundly disturbed by the destruction wrought by the Industrial Revolution, set up Morrison Company, a company to bring back beauty to the world through the application of unalienated labour. The designs they create, a celebration of the natural world and growing things, will still be found in fabric shops 130 years later. June 2101, the Upper Thames, England.
Clara, Dick, Ellen and the Dreamer of Dreams arrive for the haymaking festival. The Dreamer is all agog at the common wheel he has seen as they rode upstream, a world where town and country bred alike have recovered the arts of life they had lost, and the aspiration after complete equality is recognised as the bond of all happy human society. Ellen and the Dreamer wander through the old manor house near the river. Perhaps, though we are not told this, they make love in the bed where the dream of John Ball had been dreamt and where the earthly paradise had been glimpsed. If others can see it, as I have seen it, says the dreamer, then it may be called a vision rather than a dream. Eighteenth of March, eighteen seventy one, France. In Montmartre, government troops refused to fire on a rebellious crowd and instead turned their weapons on their officers. The communards abate rents for the period of the siege, permit a three year delay for the payment of outstanding bills, set up unemployment exchanges, abolish night work for bakers. Trade unions and workers' co ops take over factories. A young songwriter, inspired, sees a world where workers have arisen from their slumbers, where comrades have come rallied, where the last fight is being faced. 18th. January to April, 1891, three miles from Barcaldon, Queensland, and not so far from where my mother was born. The Union Camp is a town in itself. It has a population of a thousand men living in shanties and tents, a library of 600 books and a drum and whistle band. From its flagpole blows the blue southern cross of Eureka. Eighteen ninety four, Paraguay, South America. They work, they sing, they moralize. They suffer adversity but find its uses sweet. They design jokes to make the monkey stew less repugnant. They unselfconsciously borrow one another's socks and shirts. Ten thatched houses are built and a thatched dining room with eight tables. Two acres of monte are cleared and planted with vegetables. And for the time being, the dining room serves mandioca, damper, dried beans, rice and beef. An orange orchard is planted too the thin-skinned Paraguayan orange, more brown than orange, and beautifully sweet. 30th of May 1911, Transvaal, South Africa. The Satyagrahis, the wielders of truth, set up their cooperative commonwealth. There are two wells and a spring and a thousand fruit trees. They farm, they grow fruit, make work clothes, learn sandal making from a nearby Trappist monastery, conduct school and experiment with nature cure remedies. Hindus, Muslims, Parsis and Christians work together. They learn self-sufficiency and self-discipline. When the marches, when the jailings come in the campaign against racial discrimination, they are ready. 1914, Mexico. Peace returns, the first since the fighting began four years before and the last until it is to end five years later. The members of the Liberating Army of the South go home to their villages and refound local society in civil terms. They elect provisional municipal and judicial authorities and claim surrounding assets. Sugar mills and distilleries are confiscated, repaired and put back into operation, with the profits going to defence and the support of war widows. The repartition of lands is carried out in conformity with the customs and usages of each pueblo. Thus the villages of this patria chica, this little homeland, are born anew.
11th of January 1933, province of Cadiz, Spain. The mayor is told that a libertarian commune has been proclaimed. The four civil guards in the village are disarmed and shut up. The red and black flag is unfurled. Preparations are made for the defence of the village and for the division of the land.